Welcome to Mud 79. I'm Fearless Fred Kennedy, the creator of this totally original and in no way authorized Star Wars fan fiction podcast. If you're listening to this, there's a good chance that you love Star Wars. Well, I love it too. And I've always wanted to tell my own story in a galaxy far, far away. A story that's less about Skywalkers and more about those who were on the front lines. A boots on the ground story about how those living in the galaxy survive the horrors of war. That's what Mud 79 is all about. If you are new to the show, welcome, but please be aware this is a series. So if you don't want to be totally lost, start from the beginning with episode one. You don't want to be a stormtrooper. This is episode 11, Snow. The scouts of Platoon 79 completed their mission in the Riley and Foothills, but sustained heavy casualties, including the loss of Private Staven, Solomon Kwai's closest friend. He's still recovering from his wounds when he sees a familiar shape in the sky, the Theta class, which means the Inquisitor has returned. The last time I'd seen the Inquisitor's Theta class was during the assault on the warehouse two months ago. I figured she was gone and had taken her sidekicks with her. I guess not. The Lardies passed overhead and out of sight with the Theta class tight behind. I took a sip from my coffee and a drag off my stick. Made me cough. My body still hurt from my injuries in the field and my lungs were the worst because of the infections. I didn't care. The sticks gave me something to do with my hands. They hadn't stopped shaking since the last time I saw Staven. When it was done, I flicked the butt into the bin and headed off to the admin building. The air was cold and the frigid temperatures did their best to numb the constant smell of sweetened sewage that hung over the camp. We hoped that once the cold really came in force and the river froze, it might not smell so bad outside. The island's surface was now completely covered. Walls and keys dominated the shoreline, bristling with gun positions and anti-aircraft towers at the southern and northern tips. Across the river, east and west, we were defended by more observation towers and heavy gun turrets. There were also small encampments there now as well both sides of the river, including artillery and small arms ranges, camps, housing, barracks. Bridge construction was already being planned for the following spring. Camp Vibus was now the largest military installation in the Northern Hemisphere. This added firepower was needed to protect the Kenyan, which kept piling up, including the massive stores of the stuff we'd found at that enemy landing pad. See, even though the Empire was set on holding and securing all this Kenyan, meaning getting it off the planet and ship it to a military storage or manufacturing facility outside of the system, the captain of the Star Destroyer in orbit didn't want it on board his vessel. Even though it could easily hold all of it, and believe me, there was no one within a dozen light years that could even damage their shields. It was without a doubt the best place for all of it. But he insisted that the Crossfire was a warship, not a cargo hauler. The Kenyan would wait with us until civilian or military freight haulers could be allocated to secure its removal. So there it sat, under heavy guard, 24 hours a day. We kept busy, though. Ops were flying out constantly. Patrols across the sector responding to calls for aid. Militias were far more active. Nothing major was happening, just little dust-ups, and then they'd vanish into the mist. It kept our troops moving to secure order and maintain the trust we were building with the locals. Combine that with the work being done around the camp and... There just weren't enough of us to do what was being asked. We were getting so short-staffed, local contractors were hired to assist with the construction of new facilities. Not just storage units, but 
detail work in the satellite camps on either side of the river, laying duracrete for landing pads, even digging exterior wall foundations. The central admin building was the most dominant structure in Camp Vibus. It was like a separate fortress within the camp proper. See, all Imperial field positions have the same basic layout and defensive systems. There would be an outer wall and a series of defensive fortifications, and then you'd have the barracks, vehicle bays, landing pads, mess halls, infirmaries, etc. Then in the middle of the camp, in the most dominant position, would be the admin building. It had its own wall that stood 10 feet tall, watchtowers at the corners, and only one way in or out, a massive gate that passed by a security checkpoint. Let me see your identification. It was really just a squat bunker with a reinforced duracrete exterior, built strong enough to withstand direct hits from turbo lasers and heavy weapons. It was dug into the ground, only half exposed with a trench running around its perimeter. All this security was needed because the admin structure proper housed the main generators, the main armory and heavy munitions depot all the interstellar comms equipment. There was also a brig where most prisoners were kept and interrogated. Every now and again, you'd see them out doing menial labor, like picking up trash. Imperial policy was to rehabilitate, at least when it was deemed appropriate, allow for indentured servitude within the Imperial structure. You could even choose to serve in the military under a reform unit which came with a standard soldier's pension. It was just double the regular contract time of service, 10 years as opposed to five. Most opted to work in labor positions, refineries, factories, etc. It kept them out of action, but it was just as dangerous. I would never want to spend a shift in a Durasteel plant. Those places were like ovens, and the chems seeping out of the ore would ravage your lungs, even with a steady dose of Bacta. Best to put on the boots, friend. Service in the army was the safest bet by a mile. I was headed to the duty office, and I saw a scout from the 84th who'd hit up Firepoint Beta during the last big op. They were dug in. Really put up stiff resistance. But we managed to take both heavy cannon down with our first barrage from the mortars. Then we just laid steady fire. They retaliated. I heard a bunch of rockets on our positions. Three of us were killed. Brutal. The look on his face when he brought up those rockets. I'd seen that expression in the mirror. I flashed back to the sound of those Wendeu squawking as they swarmed our mortar position. That sound, the way it echoed, was answered by more beating of wings. I drifted out, drifted into my mind. Didn't really dwell on them, though. I thought about what brought them there. I mentioned that canister being shot out of the rocket launcher with the mist. It was some sort of hyper-concentrated pheromone, mating hormone. Drove them all into a frenzy. They rolled in and in their hyper-aggravated state, they just wanted to feed and breed. Ripped us apart. I could see that canister in my head, losing myself in the moment and having this idea I knew what it was and shot the guy before he launched it. Sometimes I would replay the fantasy and shoot it midair. I just did something that kept those giant flapping lizards from ever arriving. The image played in slow motion in my head a lot, reimagining myself being that guy who saves the day. Staven was alive because I saw the shot before anyone else did and I took it. I succeeded. It was a dream. She was dead. Four others too. Because I missed the shot. Because I was too late. Because I was a failure. If Staven was here, she'd tell me not to be such a mopey bastard. But if she was here, I wouldn't need to be a mopey bastard. I didn't hear the duty clerk calling my name. 
Private Kwai, are you all right? I followed them to their desk, and as we sat down, they reviewed my paperwork. They asked how my recovery was going and how soon I thought I'd be combat ready. I told them I would like to be assessed within the end of the week, and they smiled. My temporary post in the armory was approved, and I found out Mondi was given the same detail. The mornings would be with the 79th, classroom, drill. And in the afternoon, we'd be sorting ammo and cleaning weapons together at the range. That'd be all right. Then in a week or two, I would be reassessed and hopefully be put back into rotation. I was also back in the barracks. Mind you, things had been rearranged a bit. My bunk was in a new position. It was where the rest of the scouts should have been. As it stood, there were only three of us sleeping in that spot now. The first night with the empty beds was hard. It just didn't look right. My eyes would open up and there'd be wind howling outside and across from me was an empty bed. I wasn't sleeping much. Modified duty was all right. The armory had some old timers in there, including a first sergeant who walked with a bionic leg. Name was Porthos, short, skinny human in his late thirties. So hairy, he must have been part Wookiee. Had signed with the Republic Army when he was 16. Fought in multiple conflicts before the Clone Wars even broke out. He knew blaster rifles, though. Had old ones mounted in the issue locker. Including a Mandalorian blaster pistol he claimed was an authentic Crusader weapon. That would mean it was a few thousand years old. I doubted he was telling the truth probably had a new story for every new face that walked in the door. He showed us how he expected his weapons to be kept and stored. Cleaned one himself, taking the whole thing apart while maintaining eye contact with us. Not a piece out of place. This was his world. No one else's, regardless of rank. I don't care if a grand moff is out there. You see someone breaking code, something that doesn't sit right, you come to me. Me. No duty corporals, no squad sergeants. Me. Do I make myself clear troopers? He may have kept things tight, but he and his staff were fantastic teachers. In a few days, I learned more about the inner workings of our rifles than I had in the previous year. He would cut the stuff from the text down to what mattered and show me how to tweak the inner workings of our rifles to get more out of them refocusing the emitters and plasma receivers, realigning the uptake in the receiver proper. Things I would never have tried on my own for fear of breaking it. Mondi was right there with me. She was knee deep. We would take back ammo from troopers on the range, repair clips and prepped damage weaponry for the engineers and old timers to fix. After the range was closed, Porthos let everyone working there go nuts, firing off the e-webs, RPS 6s, all of it. You want to rush? Get behind an E web and see it cut through heavy ship plating. That's a good time. Get some! I would work with my E 11S, practicing the fine art of shooting at range. Firing off rounds that late in the day was difficult because of the way the sunlight would blind you. So we had to find other ways to calculate our distance. We used mirages and estimated the wind to figure out the perfect shot. Once we hit the target, we'd pack up and hop on a speeder back to camp. We needed to take a speeder because the range itself was on the east side of the river. That was the only real drag about being there, waiting for a speeder to get back in time to catch dinner at the mess hall. Timing was tight and sometimes we'd wind up with the shitty remnants of what no one else wanted. Scraps from the table, if you will. But it was a small concern given how much fun I was having. My first week was wrapping up when I got a summons to Orto's office. That was unusual. He was rarely in his office because it kept him from being on the square, grinding us into dust. When I got there, he was sitting at his desk reviewing some hollows. Sit down, Private. I did, and then I watched him read for a few minutes. His expression didn't change at all. Just one hollow, then the next, then the next. 
And then he reached into his desk and pulled out a bottle. Hazy green liquid. Tibian wine. The real reason we were here. He popped the cork and raised the bottle to his lips, then offered it to me. Take a sip. It's good stuff. I did as asked, and he wasn't lying. I'd had my share of spirits, but nothing matched what came out of that bottle, like dragging a silk whisper over your tongue and having its remnants grow flowers on your palate. Just magic. How are you enjoying your time at the range, Solomon? My first name? That wasn't normal. Did he have some test results that said I was dying? Did he get a memo saying someone was dead back home? My heart was beating as fast as it was when I was locked in that crate. First Sergeant Porthos has good things to say about you. Complimented your shooting, actually. I was still hung up on him using my first name. What was it he really wanted to tell me here? But that's not why you're here. All right, finally. This guy may have been the finest soldier I'd ever seen, but he was really letting me squirm here. Maybe that was the point. There's an op coming down the pipe. A big one. And you won't be coming. I didn't want to go on a big op. I never wanted to go, but I had a sense of duty. Well, a sense of loyalty. I didn't want to let my platoon down. Legitimately. It's so dumb, but we all have this need to be there with everyone else, no matter what happens. They are an extension of you. You're not at optimal combat readiness, trooper. Then he just stared at me, maintaining eye contact, like he was prompting me to speak. But I didn't quite know what he was getting at. He reached into the webbing hanging behind his desk and pulled out a heavy knife. It wasn't a vibro blade, but it was quality steel. Maybe Beskar? Simple design, ten inches long. He placed it on the table and leaned back in his chair. My designation out of the tank was AQ-618, but my name is Dev Auto. It was given to me after a battle on Auto Plutonia. Part of a campaign where thousands of lives were lost. My brothers, the people I grew up with. But I killed a lot of clankers. So the other survivors started calling me Auto as a nickname. And every time they said it, I'd be back there watching my family die. I had read all about the battles on Orto Plutonia before even signing up. It was an ice world. Conflicts between the native species on the planet and the Pantorans who claimed dominion ended eventually with the Separatists looking to take advantage of the tension. A lot of bloody skirmishes were fought on the tundra there. The hollows were incredible to watch windswept peaks and blowing snow. It always looked so foreign and far away as a kid. There was an escape in it because I didn't think of suffering as anything more than entertainment. Now, I don't feel things the same way you do. It's not in my genetic makeup, but it wore on me. Eventually, I was no longer in an optimal state myself. My unit commander told me to take up woodworking. He motioned to countless small wooden figures on a shelf behind him. Little carvings of birds, a few dozen, different types of woods, just a multitude of colors. I thought it was stupid, but it was an order. I obeyed. The loss of control I would feel when dealing with my own memories became secondary whenever I was carving something. I felt like I was in charge. I was giving shape to something that was shapeless. And now, when what happened feels more present than what's happening, I get to work on a fresh piece of wood. The silence hung between us. It was like a veil being lifted. I was seeing a new side of him. Maybe that's not for you, though. If you need someone to talk to, there are doctors at the medical facility. Droids, even. It helps to work things through, to, to talk about things rather than keep them buried. And I need you at your best, Kwai. Am I making myself clear enough? Absolutely, sir, I said instinctively. Good. Dismissed, Private. 
He went back to work. The bottle sat on the corner of his table. I walked out of the office door and Mondi was outside waiting. You get the call too? I nodded. She pressed me for information, but was called in before I even had a chance to respond. See you at the range. I was clearing a blockage from a mortar tube when she walked into the hut. The look on her face told me she wasn't heading out either. A mixture of confusion and anger danced in her wide eyes. She shook her head, putting her hands on her hips. LT said I wasn't at optimal combat readiness. I laughed and confessed I was told the same thing. That guy was all code. It's funny to me that when the Republic needed to fight robots, they just made their own out of meat. I'd asked if he'd suggested she start doing woodworking, and she looked at me confused. It was her body that wasn't ready. That hadn't really occurred to me. She was still on parasite meds, and they were concerned that if she was wounded, her blood could potentially contaminate others. As such, she was going to be left to modify duties until she was clean. What about you? You still dealing with infections from that op? I was still chipping away at a patch of carbon scoring inside the mortar tube. I kept going at it, but then it slipped out of me. I just let it all go. Told her everything. How the Inquisitor was living rent-free in my head. That every time I closed my eyes, I heard her voice. Solomon. I could hear her calling my name. Solomon. I could hear her reminding me of things I thought I'd moved on from. Solomon. I didn't know if I was going crazy or what. It was like a perpetual echo in my mind. I confessed that when we were locked up in those crates on the boat, I had to focus to keep myself from completely losing it. Mondi didn't get weird about it. We just talked for close to an hour, all while reorganizing the ammunition and preparing weapons for any repairs we couldn't handle ourselves. She seemed genuinely curious about what I was going through, especially when it came to the Inquisitor. Made sense, given both of us were brought up on pro-Jedi propaganda. But her questions were analytical, like she was studying it from a scientific perspective, as opposed to just getting a load of gossip or indulging in her own curiosity. Have you ever thought that maybe she's just using you? You know how the Jedi were using the Republic to place themselves in a position of power? Maybe she's using you now to help her assignment or whatever she has to do here. It sounds just like all those fables about the Force we'd hear when we were little. I don't think you're crazy, Kwai. I think she's in your head, latched on or something, using you like a pawn or manipulating you. I hadn't thought about it like that, and it terrified me. I knew that part of me, at least, was still coming to grips with where I was, meaning Sestin Four in the midst of a budding war zone, being told to kill or be killed in the name of the Empire. I likened it to adjusting to hot bath water. I just wasn't there yet. The water was still hot. I just needed to relax, get acclimatized. But it seems to me now that it was actually the water was just getting hotter. That afternoon was a busy one. Platoons coming in and out, picking up ammo and charge stations, running drills on the range. They'd shoot it up pretty bad brought in a dozen rifles that were overheated and burnt out. But we finished our shift and then took the duty speeder back across the river. Ice was building up faster than I'd expected, flowing in from the south, jamming flow in some places. And thankfully, the stink was pretty much gone. It was really nice being outside at this point. When Mondi headed for the barracks to clean up, I went over to the hospital, made an appointment to speak with a profiling droid. It was a smart move. The next morning, I was in an assessment booth answering questions, telling them about my experiences. It was weird talking to a droid, but they really listened to what I had to say and responded. 
I always told myself I'd find out whoever wrote its code and thank them. I didn't mention the stuff about the Inquisitor, though. I didn't need anything like that on my record. What Mondi said really shook me. What if I had somehow become involved in a covert op? That's what I was thinking. So, the less anyone knew, the better. Instead, I just focused on my experiences in the field. The goal was just to get the check mark on my record that I'd done as asked. Honestly, though, I was getting a lot more out of my talks with Mondi on the range. I mean, she was like me. We were the ones in the field, and knowing I wasn't alone in what I was going through meant more than a droid asking me to elaborate on how I felt about things. The following two weeks were pretty active. A lot of troopers kept hitting the range, everything from rocket launchers to e-webs and portable quad cannons. Even some scouts on the long distance ranges. I would always ensure I got to be on hand when people were distance shooting. It was an ego thing. I needed to keep track of my competition. Patrols were still going out too. The 79th had run three missions in that time. Two day patrols and one overnight op in the Bista. Surveillance, responding to intercepted transmissions, calls for help. None of it was anything unusual, on paper at least. Murray told me all about it one night when we were out for a stick. There's a weird vibe out there, man. A hostility. Miners are saying it too. Towns are on edge. Sightings a small, unregistered aircraft flying off grid. We keep finding traps, mines, even shot down a probe droid, old Separatist model. He leaned back against the bench. We came up on a small mine dig that was abandoned. No one there. Orto told us to fan out and search the area. Nothing, man. No tracks, broken brush, anything. He paused and took a slow drag. Then the LT spots a singe mark from a blaster rifle. He starts doing this deep sweep, ordering us to specific spots, looking closer. He pieces together that a two-man assault team came down on the mine. Shows us where they came in from, their main targets, everything. We missed it. He rants that this type of carelessness will get us killed. Right then, a droid moves in the brush and he one-shots it with his rifle. Wasn't even looking that way clones, man. I'd heard about a lot of injuries from mines and improvised ordnance, too. No fatalities, but some lost limbs. I pressed him for anything he might know about that big op everyone was talking about. He said he didn't know much. I had to believe him. Staven was far better at needling him for information than me, so I let it slide. We finished our sticks and hit the rack. The following morning was another brisk one, snow drifting in, tiny flecks of gray blowing on a breeze. Skies were heavy. It was going to snow a lot. I'd had days like this back home. The snow there had a green hue from the airborne algae. I missed that color. It was a very specific shade of green I never found anywhere else. Mondi and I hopped onto the speeder and rode it over the river. It was frozen solid now. Big chunks of ice piled up frozen even more solid by the slow pressing water filling the cracks and freezing over itself. The range was busier than normal because there were new recruits coming in. Volunteers from local systems that had just finished their training. There were even some kids that had grown up here on Seston 4. They made a lot of appearances on the local Holonet shows, drumming up support winning the hearts and minds. They were all raw, though. Had only a patrol or two under their belt, but they were eager and disciplined. I didn't mind seeing them come in because they were all so new and nervous they didn't leave any messes for us to clean up and were gentle with their weapons, which again meant less work for me. A pair of squads had just headed out to run some move and fire drills when every alarm on the base went off. All our bracelets triggered, and the loudspeakers began summoning everyone to gear up and meet at the pads. There was a chance this was only a drill. They happened. But I knew better. We were being scrambled. 
every trooper on the range formed up and marched double time over to the speeder pads. Multiple duty speeders came in from camp and they all began piling in. I didn't know what I was supposed to be doing, so I started shoveling snow out from one of the firing trenches. It was always best to look busy. You'd get yelled at a lot less that way. All right, everyone, don't get distracted. Take advantage of the downtime and get everything squared away. I want to clear out the backlog of repairs best we can, then make our way to the hospital to assist with the wounded when they start coming back. Get it done. He spoke with familiarity. This was routine for him, or it had been a few years ago. It would be at least an hour before the lardies started going out. Everyone on call would be getting their kit in order, then going to the pad, organizing, finally flying out with some sort of briefing on the way. That's how these things tended to go, at least. I used the time to recite one of the E-11Ss that had become my pet project. I'd cranked up the receiver and focused it in to increase the penetrative power. I took everything Porthos had been going on about and poured it into this puppy. If I was ever going to name a rifle, it would be this one. I heard the door open and looked up to see Mondi heading outside. I joined her and we walked into a blizzard. Snow is really coming down. When the rain kicks up and it starts dumping on you, you hear it. Rain is loud, rhythmic, puts you to sleep. Snow? You never know how much is coming down until it's there. It's stealthy. And they're off. The first batch of lardies was up, and it was a stream of them, heading in groups of four. They were hauling saber tanks with them. Wherever they were going, it was going to be quite a show. The big guns were a necessity when advancing on strong enemy defenses. I know now they were heading to Domju. It was down south, on an island below the main continent. Coastal community, massive hydro farm set up. One of the most developed agricultural spots on the surface, actually. But the council in charge there was less than kind with the empire since we'd officially planted the flag. The tipping point was when the crossfire started picking up pockets of nothing on its sensors. Dots of zero readout all over the town cloaking devices, just like the ones coming from that compound we destroyed. Well, not me. I was busy shooting massive horned-up lizards while high on painkillers. The rest of our battalion were the ones attacking the compound. Anyways, intelligence got eyes on Domju and inserted operatives. It was crawling with militia groups, mercenaries, mid-sized fighter craft, everything. They had a small army building by the day. When the brass figured the timing was right, they called it in and we attacked. Bring the hammer down hard, take them all at once, put it all on the holonet, show the locals who runs the show. I counted 30 lardies getting air. Three quarters of the camp gone. The only infantry not outbound were a few of the FNGs who'd spilled in over the past few weeks. The rest were service staff and admin types. A few seconds after the rest of the fleet left, the Theta class slowly rose and carried up the rear. There goes your friend, Kwai. You gonna miss her? I gave her my most irritated glare and went back inside began restacking and stacking all the charged clips and got back to my E-11S. It was mostly done, or rather, it was done. Porthos was leaning over it, realigning the connections I'd missed. That's decent work, Trooper. The venting's a bit sloppy, but I can see what you were do. What the hell was that? I ran outside and saw the residue of multiple explosions in various spots around the camp pillars of black smoke, then another series of explosions. I looked south and there was an ARC-170 beginning a strafing run along the camp. It streaked over the buildings, small arms fire flashing into the sky at it, some impacting but doing no damage. Those things were airborne tanks from the Clone Wars, 
It launched a barrage of missiles at the auto turrets on the north corner. Debris flew into the air, carried by a molten cloud of red and orange. Another ARC-170 followed suit, coming in at a few hundred clicks an hour from the opposite side, spitting streams of plasma from its wing-mounted cannons. The missiles flew, and the other AA batteries were out of commission before they even got off a shot. More fighters were coming in, and they were headed right for the range. The turrets on either side of the river opened up, but whoever was operating them clearly had no clue what they were doing. I dropped and huddled against the range building as the first shots were landing around me. The missiles fired, and then the watchtowers went up. Camp Vibus was under attack. Kwai, get in here and grab a blaster. I shuffled along the wall towards the door and watched the arcs continue to strafe and lay down fire. I couldn't see what they were hitting in the camp, but they were putting down a lot of pressure. Specific targets. They weren't just laying down streams of plasma at random. They had assigned targets. Then some haulers came streaking towards the base. Just generic looking craft. Big though. Five of them. I saw them coming down near the storage yards. They were coming for the canyon. I was fixated on it until I heard the grav lifts behind me. The whine of a mid-sized cargo vessel. I turned and saw two more ships coming down by the speeder platform right next to us. Where were they coming from? Arm yourself, trooper. They're coming for the weapons. The sergeant ran out the front door with an RPS-8, a heavier-grade rocket launcher, too big for us to carry as an infantry battalion. Two more of the weaponsmiths were carrying the power cell for an E-Web behind him, heading for one of the range dugouts. A third ran past with the cannon in mount. For the Empire! The massive missile impacted against the underside of one of the ships and it tilted, grinding the opposite side into the ground, which caused it to drop down on its belly the landing gear completely obliterated. I scurried into the building and grabbed something to defend myself with when I heard the ship's auto turret light up the area in front of the entrance. The green flash of turret fire was spilling into the open door. My sniper rifle was right where I left it. I slung it over my shoulder and cinched the strap tight, slid some clips into my pockets and then grabbed another E-11. Mondi was piling RPS-6 rockets into a canvas sack. She'd strapped on some combat webbing and clipped a modified E-11 onto her back. The rest of the weaponsmiths were outside already, fighting to keep the armory from being ransacked. I assumed some of them were still fighting because no raiders had made it inside. Mondi and I headed for the side entrance, which led to the small arms range. The door opened as we approached. Three figures, obscured by the light behind them, stood in the door. They weren't with us. They had rifles in hand. A-280s. Dead giveaway. The Empire would never pay for weapons that nice. I fired first. Two of them dropped, but the third dove for cover. Mondi tossed out a detonator. It went off with a spatter, blowing the two raiders into pieces. I wiped specks of blood off my face and popped out the door, queuing into where we expected the third raider to be. They were wounded, but sent shots at us. One scorched my ear as it went past. Mondi plugged him, though. Multiple shots in the torso. We need to cripple those landers, or they'll pick the range clean. We rounded the corner, and the closest lander's auto turrets locked in and started firing. We rolled back into cover. The ground was wet from melting snow. There was yelling from the other side of the building. Blaster fire was echoing off the walls and coming through the open door of the armory. I told Mondi to load the RPS, and I would distract the ship's turrets with some detonator fire, and then she could fire a rocket at it. The idea was to just keep peppering it with explosives to ensure it couldn't fly, and hopefully the added punch of a rocket would cripple it permanently. She got to work, setting it up to fire at long range, giving the rocket extra punch, increasing its odds of penetrating the ship's hull. I threw the detonator, lobbing it high over the corner of the building, ensuring we would still have cover. Then I tossed another, and another, and another. When the first one blew, she leaned around the corner, another still going off when she pulled the trigger. The hauler's turret fired a second later and hit the end of the RPS before Mondi had pulled back, spinning her around and slamming her into the ground. 
One of the edges cut her cheek. I grabbed her webbing and hauled her back behind the corner. Then a massive explosion wrenched the air. A deep, burning foom. Debris, which was more akin to shrapnel, flew past. I leaned back around the corner and saw the ruined hull of a ship collapsed on the ground. Mondi tried to reload the rocket launcher, but the whole back end was shot. I grabbed my rifle and started rounding the corner. The other ship was smoldering too. It was sitting crooked on the ground with ruined landing gear and one side of its hull was blown in from the other ship's explosion. I had my rifle aimed at the on-ramp in case anyone came out for air. Let's go! I yelled at Mondahai to follow. She had her E-11 still clipped on and went over to the collapsed raider and took his A-280. That was a beautiful weapon. It had a slower rate of fire than an E-11, but was more accurate, packed more punch. I saw feet coming down the ramp. I aimed and waited for them to expose themselves. They were waving the smoke away, some type of pistol in their hand. Couldn't tell what it was. They were Twi'lek. I squeezed the trigger and put them down. Mondi and I had rounded the side of the building between the ships and the range building. We wanted to get to the other side, see what was going on where the firefight started. There was still blaster fire, but no E-Web, that deep thud of its heavy cannon. I tossed another detonator up into the second ship. It rolled up that last stretch of ramp and then went off. I thought I heard a scream, but we'd moved on. Mondahai poked her head around the other corner and looked back at me with a wide-eyed stare. She flashed her hand twice, four fingers each time. There were still eight raiders left. They were firing into the range building, which meant that we had allies held up inside. Those old-timers were giving them hell. I knew the layout, and there was a shallow shooting trench 15 meters from the E-Web's position. It was used for switching out the pop-up targets we'd hit. I signaled that's where I was going. Monty and I primed a pair of detonators and threw them at the enemy. Heard the shouts of confusion. And when the explosives went, I ran. The raiders knew I was coming because they opened up as soon as I made those last few steps. I dove into the trench and felt a blaster bolt cook the back of my right leg. I hit and rolled, fire still going off as I huddled on the ground. I was looking around, trying to find a way to give myself an angle without giving them an opening. I knew they were going to keep me pinned while one or two of them moved in on me. I still had an eye on the corner, and Mondi tossed another detonator. Thing went off close to someone because there was a distinct sound of tearing flesh as it exploded. Someone shrieked, and I crawled further along the trench. I hoped to get just far enough I could pop my head up quickly and get my bearings without anyone taking my head off. They were firing a few feet from where I had landed, so they didn't know where I was anymore. I rolled to my side and took a quick glance. Then Mondi opened fire. I heard the roar, and then the firing stopped. You're clear! You were never really clear. So when I came up, I had my rifle pointed exactly where I expected the enemy to be. I called on Mondi to advance, and as she moved forward, I got onto my knees and moved in low. We swept the E-Web's position, counted six bodies, and a lot of meat. Pieces of what had once been human, I couldn't tell. They had two Verk with them, though. I was putting rounds into all the bodies, just to be sure. That you two out there? The question came from inside the building. I recognized the voice. We moved to the door, yelling for them not to shoot. Only one of them was still conscious. I don't remember her name... She was one of the few Twi'lek in uniform we had at Vibus. She was leaning up against the wall, her right side bleeding and blistered. She'd been tagged a few times. She coughed and blood (laughs) spurted out from the back of her throat running down her chin. They did? We confirmed her suspicion while taking stock of the others. Porthos was in a heap on the floor. Blood was everywhere. The Twi'lek saw her glance at his body and she shook her head. The Colonel has been all over the open channel. The raiders are assaulting the canyon stores. All personnel have been ordered to assist in its defense. How are we supposed to get there? The old weaponsmith groaned as she was spraying herself down with Bacta. The river is frozen. Run. She gave us a look of pain and anger. This wasn't a joke. I ran out the door and looked through the wind and blowing snow. 
It was coming down so heavy I could barely make out the island at this point. That river was 700 meters of open terrain we'd need to cross. The ice had covered it for more than a few days. Clusters of it piled up in places. That's where we'd stick to. I went back inside. Monty was already loading a bag with more detonators and rockets. Grab that RPS-8, Kwai. Great. That thing weighed close to 50 pounds. She preloaded it and primed the rocket. I had a sudden worry I'd be climbing over a pile of frozen stink water and I'd set it off. That was followed by a cascade of scenarios involving death by rocket. I also wondered if it weighed so much that I'd crack and fall through the ice, dragged down to the bottom of the ass. Hell of a way to go. We jogged our way to the shore of the river and began making our way across. There was blaster fire coming from the camp. The snow played tricks with the sound, muffling some things, echoing others. I stepped too hard on the shoreline, breaking a thin layer of ice and sinking my foot into the wet mud. Then I fell, rolled down into a solid pile of dingy brown ice with the rocket launcher slamming into my back. That's when I heard the whine of a starfighter in the air, one of the arcs flying over the river towards the range. I tucked low, trying to hide. Mondi did the same. Then she scrambled past me. Let's go before that thing sees us. We set out, moving as fast as we could, up and down, stopping and peering around, trying to avoid the air cover. Blaster fire ringing out from the camps. Explosions from detonators. We were getting closer. Less than 200 meters to go. Every so often, the ice would crack loudly. Settling and echoing through the channels between the piles. Mondi lost her footing and rolled down one of the larger heaps, put her knee through the ice at the bottom, where it was thinnest. It shot a long crack out and water began pouring through. I grabbed her hand and pulled her up. We floundered our way back to the top of the nearest pile, just in time to watch an ARC-170 swing past with a low swoop. It pulled high and spun, letting loose a spray of fire in our direction. We ducked and rolled, the blaster fire shredding the ice, spraying water everywhere. The stench was overwhelming. It seeped into our clothes, freezing us. Had we not been so warmed up from the running, we probably would have gotten hypothermia. I spun the RPS-8 off my back as it flew overhead and locked in the targeting system. I'd need a close shot to have any chance of hitting it. I yelled at Mondahai to keep running. Better she make it than both of us die here. At that moment, I expected to die, but death seemed trivial. I didn't care. I didn't really care. I was part of something bigger. The arc zipped past and rounded back, its foils out in attack position. The whole thing was in slow motion. I held the lock on the targeting computer as it honed in. It was beeping. I was locked. But I needed to wait. The wings let loose a torrent of fire. I saw the lines of ice flying into the air where they hit. They were getting closer. The targeting computer kept beeping. I needed them to be too low to pull up or swerve. I remember it getting quiet for just a second. Then, whoosh. I didn't watch it hit. I just ran towards the shoreline. I heard the explosion and the whir of the engines as the fighter fell, then crashed into the ice. Mondi told me it was in a full 360 spin when it impacted and buried itself into the water, before slipping down below the surface. I watched Mondi clamber up the side of the river. I tried to follow her route as it seemed like the best way to ensure I didn't fall through. There were these loud, ominous echoes as the ice kept cracking. It was the most terrified I'd ever been. There's something truly unsettling about the thought of drowning, even if it isn't in the foulest smelling liquid imaginable. When she pulled me onto the shore, I collapsed at her feet. She choked and started coughing, spraying blood onto the snow. I was about to speak, but she was already turning and moving towards the camp's main wall. I took a deep breath, like I was alive again. Because I was. I'd made it. Now all we needed to do was turn back a massive, well-coordinated enemy attack.
Who are the raiders attacking Vibus? How did a military faction this well equipped get a foothold on Sestin 4? And what's waiting for Mondi and Kwai when they make it over Camp Vibus's walls? That's next time on Episode 12 Fire and Mud. Thank you for joining me this week on Fearless Fred Presents Mud 79, a Star Wars fan fiction podcast. If you haven't already, make sure you follow the show so you'll never miss an episode. While you're there, don't forget to rate and review us. It helps grow the show and will make my contemptible harpy of a producer very happy. We're available for free at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, and wherever else you get your favorite streaming audio. You can also listen at CuriousCast.ca. Be sure to check out the show notes for more information and a full listing of Mud 79's cast. If you want to reach out to me directly, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at fearless underscore Fred or email me at mud79 at curiouscast.ca. This show is hosted and written by me, Fred Kennedy, and Dila Velasquez, the Harpy, our producer. Sound design is by moi and final production is by Rob Johnson. And I'll see you next week for more Mud 79.